All right, welcome to the arcade. I'm Mr. Pebbles, and we're continuing with Golden Treasure, the Great Green. Uh, we have just entered adulthood, and uh, we are, yeah, we're going to go ahead and discover, see what's going on uh, with for us. All right, we saw some of this last time. We can alter our own scent now. And I think, yeah, we we are immune to poison and diseases now. Which is great. New sun has risen. Gathering what truths and treasures you can you may before the upcoming grand moot. All right, so things have really opened up for us now it did recommend to reconnect with the great green first so let's go ahead and do that the sacred glen though your eyes see only a wooded hollow your whole being can sense the deeper truth this is a living labyrinth, tenderly maintained by many subtle beings who have been drawn here over the ages. The essence lines of Earth herself converge here, each pathway a vein or artery coursing inexorably towards or away from the heart, where old is made new. Now that you have trod the clouds, you can bypass the maze and fly straight to the center, but only the worthy may stand in the glory of the living one. Dare you approach. <clears throat> Um, yeah. We're worthy. You alight before the tree. Humbly, you fold your wings, bow your head, and surrender your pride as you enter the chamber beneath, between the roots. Even as an adult, there is somehow more than enough room for you here. You lie down and close off your senses one by one until your body is perfectly still, save for the thrum of the rhythm. Sleep sets into your flesh, and your mind is tempted to follow one of the millions of false pathways leading to shallower pools within the dreaming. But from air you have learned intelligence and self-expression. From fire you have learned passion and strength. From water you have learned flexibility and perspicacity. Sorry. And from earth you have learned humility and fortitude. You cannot be distracted or deceived. Your way cannot be barred. Temptation is powerless before your hard-forged will. Poised in the center, you abide. The dragon abides. Multiplicities and distinctions fade as the many become four, and four becomes one. There it is. My sweet fang, greatest of those who push earth towards completion, hunter of your own heart, your body and essence are nearly full wrought, and you are etched the numbers and painted are the signs. Before you lay three paths. They are the paths trod down by the great ones of your people. Choose a path and receive from me a mighty gift that you may walk with beauty upon your way. What path will you choose? I choose the path of wisdom. I choose the path of compassion. I choose the path of strength. I choose none of these. Um, we've kind of been going down the path of compassion, though. I know you're saying we're smart, which we kind of are, but we've kind of been compassionate. Yeah, we've been all compassion this, this entire way. Compassion, favored dream of Earth, reflection of her inmost self. Compassion, in which the victim becomes the final victor. Compassion, which makes mirrors of all things. I grant you blessings of water and earth, pillars of compassion. Oh, nice. And also a warning. Only those who have water's final gift shall forge a new beginning. Until the tenth degree of the circle is known, seek out understanding of that which flows. Okay, so we need the tenth degree of water. And fear not the sacrifice, for it is not feather, nor scale, nor even tail, which is sacred, but only essence. 
you awaken much later. Sun is dying, and you know better than to be here when darkness falls, for night and the great green are lovers. Even a mighty drack would be crushed between them. Mm, precious essence. Mmm. Returning to your lair, you ponder what you have learned. You have been strengthened by the blessing of the spirit. Time will tell whether it is strength enough to triumph over the adversities ahead. <laughs> Strong. Oh, there it is again. The Fey Dragon. There you are, my beloved. I taste your essence here in the dreaming. It is cool and deep and soothing. Yes, you are ready, beloved. Come to the heartwood, setward and warmward from your lands. Come to me on the far side of a new journey, tiny and yet vast. I await you with a rare treasure in my mouth. Come. Upon awakening, you feel an uncomfortable dryness, as though you've been drawn out of an embracing, breathable sea against your will to a harsh and hot wasteland. Somehow, though, you now know of a place where All Mother, last of the Crystal Clan, waits for you. We got a hunt, but I guess that's our next adventure. Uh, but I don't know where that's at. Is that... Oh, hang on. Let's hunt real quick. Let's not get too super... Yeah, let's go after Woodstrider Birther. Silently draw nearer. Oh, I missed. All right, dance of destruction. What was, what was once the leaves of the great trees was fashioned into the body and essence of this graceful wood strider, and now it is yours. The meal leaves you feeling deeply satisfied. Gained a lot of energy. Alright, let's hunt another one. Maybe I won't miss this time. Miss! All right. All right, that's it. Shouldn't have to hunt any more. So what's interesting is this was, uh, I forget his name, but he was the drag warden. This was warden's territory, but you don't see him. It's just the no tails, the humans. So she said, yeah, right? I'm going to investigate this area with this purple dragon symbol because I think... <gasps> hey! It's our friend, but he's white now. Is it dreaming? Is it waking? Is it even possible to tell the difference? D 
Does it know why it has come? Is it ready? This is certainly the same blaze tale you encountered before your last sleep. Writhing question, who became the envoy of the great All-Mother long ago? Uh-oh. Um, I think you're right. So, no bad feelings about your tale, right? That should, however, be quite impossible. Many lifetimes of the Blazetail people have surely passed since you encountered it. We smell it. A delicious question. How does the Blazetail resist time? Does it not know that in enkindling another with kin essence prolongs life? And does it know the still deeper secret, that all boundaries are illusions, that in the turnings which have passed, the blaze tail which was, has merged with all mother? Oh, this is where she told me to go. Would it help it understand if it knew that we had sacrificed knowing ourselves as a drop to gain understanding of ourselves as a sea? Would it help to envision a single grain of sand releasing its delusions and realizing at last that it was a shore all along? Indeed, impossible as it may seem, everything in this forest shares a certain scent. It is as though everything here has merged. In this place of harmony and unity, the most perfect forest which has ever existed, or is it a living blasphemy against individuality? A few among the kin regard the elder known as All Mother as an enlightened, transcendent being. Others see it as a dangerous heretic, a spreader of untruths, which would degrade and weaken the kin if they were to be embraced. Is it ready? Shall we summon All Mother to commune with it? No, leave this bizarre place and spend the sun elsewhere. Yes. Ah, uh, do we think we're ready? We're pretty strong for whatever she might throw at us. Let's commune with the All Mother. Do we need mastery of water first? That's an excellent question. We're at seventh grade mastery. Let's, you're right, let's go and challenge some of the other dragons first. Let's spin the sun elsewhere. You're right. Yeah, I don't know if we need 10th, but it did say, let's check out Warden's place real quick. Oh, look at this disgusting display. I say as I have wolves at my own den. Is this the Riverwood? That bastion of purity zealously guarded by one of your own? Where is its kinlord's scent boundary? Oh no, did they kill him? Certainly, things change during a great sleep of turnings, but you never thought such a sharp transformation was possible. Why would Warden allow no tails to build a hive lit here? Air betrays you with a shift of wind. It is fond of doing that, which brings your scent to the enslaved clan singers who guard this place. They begin yelling frantically, danger, 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 danger. Help, 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 help. You do not hear or smell any tailless nearby, though a few tree tails dance up the trees, startled by the racket. You could just leave, but with no tailless about, this might be a rare opportunity to enter one of their hivelets and learn something of them. And who knows, there may be treasure inside. Danger, danger! Help! Help! Help, help, help! Apparently, clan singers lose their minds when they join the no tails. This is very annoying. Sing to the clan singers, summon your own clan singers to deal with these slave beasts, scare them away with a blast of fire, challenge them to a dance of destruction, avoid them and continue cold words following the no-tail sense. Yeah, let's try singing to the clan singers first. Maybe we can talk some sense into them. You're bad, very bad, an enemy, foe of the gods. Yes, your blazing breath and sharp claws, your colorful feathers, these things are not part of the new way. Leave now and stay away, stay far, far away, and never come back, or the gods will smite you. As their sigils draw across your mind, they continue to assault your ears with their horrible, hollering mouth squall. Ask the clan singers why they have joined with the alien no-tails. Not no tails, gods. They are the gods. The new gods have shown us mercy, given us food, safety, and great love. Filled with compassion, perfect they are. Our pups survive, our bellies are full, and our cold times are warm and safe. 
In the dead of night, the prophets of our people sing of the gods' greatness, and the gods are so humble that they come out and silence us, even striking us if we continue. Such humility, such enlightenment. Yes, their mighty music even allows them to control Earth herself, making her birth plants for them to eat. They can even fell mighty hillbacks without even touching them, bouncing sharp things into them from afar. We have sworn an oath, a mighty oath of binding. We are theirs, and they are our gods forever. In ten thousand turnings, the drac will be gone, slain to the very last by the gods, but we will remain and trust and sacrifice. And even then, it will not be enough to show our love for them. Praise the new gods. When they attain the stars, we shall go with them, while your bones will rot in the dust. Earth and sun gave us nothing. The new gods give us everything. Wow, rude. I'm going to summon my own clan singers to deal with them. They're very rude. Extremely rude. No, no tail pilled. Your own clan singers are more than happy to deal with these apostates. After a brief verbal bout, which included such poisonous and I've never even seen this word, vituperative insults that they make your feathers puff out, the clan singers begin a vicious and bloody dance of destruction. Oh! Though they could simply have run away, the slaves fight with every fiber of their being, confidence to the last breath that their new gods would save them. Oh no! Oh no! It was almost admirable in its way, though the dance was soured by the sharp red hatred both sides had for each other. It is rather dark in here, especially with your hindquarters blocking the entryway. Alas, this is as far in as you can squeeze yourself. No matter, you can smell several interesting objects nearby, such as... What is this? It smells part tree, part beast. Yes, the curve is quite a bit of elm, and the straight line smells of some kind of large fur beast. A hillback, perhaps, or a plains runner. It seems somewhat elastic. Oh, it's a bow. That was interesting. There is definitely something appealing about that sound. It also seems foreboding for some reason, but that is part of its charm. There seems to be quite a lot of dead dry grass in here. Perhaps they are hoping, in vain, that the sweet smell will cover up their own stink. Is this a tailless hatchling? No, it doesn't have a rhythm and isn't flesh inside. Are they trying to make more no-tails out of grass? It might be possible, depending on what strange powers they have. A terrifying thought. There is definitely something here. Another tree and beast object. Beast skin, great grazer from the smell, and tree flesh. Are the tailless trying to combine trees and beasts into something? It seems popular. Perhaps there is something inside. You begin by lightly striking it with a claw. That was unexpected. Your feathers are now quite puffed out. Huh. Definitely hollow. Just an empty container. Just one more time. Enough now. Moving on. Aha! Shinestone, the type that begins sun-colored and ends sea-colored. A lovely aroma. But you have never seen a shape like this in nature. Could the talus be able to change shinestone? There is a small pit full of ashes and burnt tree remnants, so perhaps they could melt it. But how could they convince it to form such a symmetry once melted? It is frozen in a moving circle like the shape of the water elements. This reeks of plains runner, but it is actually a second skin. These are the slain good beast pelts with which the talus cover up their bodies. Obviously, they do this because they want to smell better, they are constantly cold, they wish to become good beasts, they are ashamed of themselves. Well, I feel like they are constantly cold because obviously they don't have any furs of their own or feathers. It's complicated. <laughs> I feel like all of these reasons are pretty accurate, but those furries... How painful that would be! That would also explain why they keep fire spirits in that small central pit. They should learn the fine art of sunbathing, or just go warmwards like the feather beasts in season. It is difficult to know what to make of these discoveries. The objects are too well used to be part of a trove, if the tailless even have those. 
Still, perhaps they might have some value. The tale is, they return. All of that mindless yelling from the clan singers may have brought them back, or perhaps mere chance. In any case, you still have a chance to escape. If you quickly leave empty mouth, you may escape unseen, but if you take these souvenirs, they will surely spot you as you go. Of course, if the talus were simply destroyed, that would not be an issue, would it? Leave now, quickly. Gather up these strange things and return to your lair. Face them in a dance of destruction. There are at least two of them from what you can hear. I think leaving. I think learning about as much as I can without being discovered. I've already killed their dogs and they're kind of, yeah, I agree. I was about to say that myself. They're kind of trash treasures. Like maybe that shiny thing that looked like water would be the only thing I'd say, but yeah, they're kind of trash treasures. We're going to leave now quickly. I already killed their dogs. You squeeze out, lightly bashing your head on the portal frame, and are soon far away. Hopefully they will not surmise that a drac was here, or if they do, they will not know that it was you. You have not yet discovered Warden's whereabouts, nor why the tailors are so close to your lands. The trail leads coldward, deeper into what was once the river wood. Oh, that got us air and water. Good, we need water. Yeah, we're going to find out this mystery of where Warden is. I got a bad feeling about it, though. Good, 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 good. Check it out. Eighth grade mastery in the water element. Intuition is very powerful. By spending energy, you can see with certainty whether you will succeed on a given story action. Excellent. And something about or which element I might need. Oh, look how much more story stuff opened up. Wow. Okay. Um, lots of no-tail stuff. Let's check out this sheep here. My goodness. I guess we're going to find out why everybody is accepting the no-tails as saviors and gods. Heading coldwards from the hivelet you discovered on the edge of the riverwood, you are soon greeted by a remarkable sight and smell. Fur beasts, large fur beasts, many, many, many large fur beasts. It seems as though every great grazer and slave surefoot on blessed earth has gathered here to feed. The scent of them and their prodigious waste carries across their territory. A small group of slave clan singers on a nearby hill growl a curse and run, no doubt to raise their tailless masters against you. Of course, the grazing fur beasts are fearful. A brave surefoot birther asks you cautiously, have you come to hunt us, great Drakin? Whatever you choose will become the truth, at least this sun. We're full up, and we're going to say no, because we're, uh, we're here on a mission from God. The masses breathe a collective, grass-scented sigh of relief at the news. Some go back to their continuous destruction of greenery. Yeah, we're scouting. But others aim their eyes and ears towards you, curious to know what would bring a mighty Drak to their gathering, if not the scent of flesh. Two tribes seem to be coexisting here, the great grazers and the slave surefoots. The earth-shaking grazers were once fit and muscular, but now they resemble ambulatory slabs of meat. Their giver's milk part seems swollen. The surefoots, with their strong legs and feet of stone, once plied the high regions. These ones are shaggier than their free brethren, their givers have smaller head weapons, and their birthers have none. Indeed, there are few givers here at all, of either people. The vast majority seem to be birthers and their children. Sing as you will. Ask about the slave surefoots in their tribe. Ask the great grazers about their people. Ask them why they have traded freedom for servitude. Ask them why there are so few givers here. Ask them about their tailless masters. Um, yeah, we're going to start about the slave surefoots. One of the rare givers, sporting a strip of what smells like grazer skin about its neck, answers. We are a tribe of the Surefoot people, ancient masters of hill and dale. Once we knew not the blessing of the new gods, and stripped moss from jealous stone, the last leaves from naked shrubs to survive. 
Now the lowlands belong to us. There is more delicious green here than we could ever consume. When I was a child, there were so few in my clan that I sometimes felt lonely. Now there are more of us than there are stars in the great above. I cannot even hope to know all of their scents, and this is only one clan of my tribe, and one tribe of my people. All of this is the fruit of one great discovery, trust. This is the name we have given to what we have learned. The new gods will grant us wealth and increase our people so long as we do not doubt. Doubt opens the path to fear, and fear to violence and exile. So we trust. Our birthers sing gentle songs of the new gods' greatness to the children, and our givers lower their proud heads in their presence. Indeed, we hardly need our head weapons at all. Such things are relics of our past. Already they are gone from our spirits and our brothers' bodies, and soon even we givers will be crownless. It is good. It is the way forward. Ask the great grazers about their people. A mighty birther, creator of many, sings a simple reply as one of its children drinks from its milk store. We are as we were, the great grazers. Once a mountain fell in love with the horizon. Each morning and evening it would show its beautiful pink underbelly to mountain from afar, and mountain wished to become one with it. So the mountain traded a little of its great size for legs and wandered the body of earth, eating green things and slowly chasing after its love. Such are we. Yeah, these guys are in a sad state. We give thanks for these bodies, which can now taste the sweetness of grass, can see horizon drape its colors over new places, the low green valleys, the sea. Deep within we remember being mountains, and the peace and quiet strength of those long ago times still live within us. But many wish to take the quiet strength of mountain into themselves, the draken, the great slide claw, even the bold clan singers. Now few dare. The wrath of the new gods keeps them away. Ask them why they traded freedom for servitude. A surefoot birther sings, What is freedom? Is it living in fear? Is it birthing gentle, clean-hearted children, only to lose them forever in less than a moon? Is it struggling to grow one's clan, only to have those we love slain again and again in the night by beasts of flang, fang and claw? Is that free... If that is freedom, then yes, gladly we have given it away, and a new peace is ours. The new gods watch over us, closer than sun or even earth. A grazer matriarch sings, It is so. Whole suns, whole moons pass without fear. There is only life, only the feast. The no tales lead us to the horizon. There are prices to pay. The tailless burn strange sigils into our hides, divide families, lash us with the skin of the dead when we are slow. Yes, they chew away our fur with shinestone eat teeth and pull us painfully by our necks. But when we are lost, they come to find us, and they sing songs which are strange and pleasant. They will do the dance of destruction with all who threaten us, yes, even the drac. Such is their compassion for us, and we repay it with trust. The slave clan singers are returning with their flat-faced masters. There are many of them. Remaining here would probably be unwise. Fortunately, the hillside makes for an easy takeoff. A few downhill leaps and bounds and the wind catches your wings. Soon the slave beasts are just small dots against a grass blanket. Another son, if you wish, you may return here to hunt. For now, you must be content with having learned more about the once good beasts who now live under the shadow of the tailless. They worship and adore the no-tails who breed and harvest them like plants, who put up walls around them, who strike them and take away their young givers forever. Are such beasts mad, or is this the beginning of a terrible new sanity? Man. I think Warden's dead, you guys. I think that's what we're about to discover. Seventh grade, a mastery in the fire element. Fall into a holy rage for the remainder of a fight. Enraged, you feel no pain and immune to mind tricks. Yeah. Well, I think he would put up with that nonsense if he was the one doing it. But he wouldn't put up with that nonsense if the no-tails were doing it. Okay. Place is too close to the high for you to approach safely. Increase your understanding of the tailless to discover what lies here. Okay. Uh, 
Oh! Two storms, one in the great above, another below, neither yet begun, but both inevitable. You do not need to understand the yelpings of these tailless givers to know what is going on. Though they all look and smell the same to you, the group on the left must represent the local hive due to their positioning, making the group on the right foreign invaders. It probably isn't a full-on territorial challenge like those the Drac issue. Surely more would be fighting if everything were at stake. Still, it must be a serious matter if they would do the dance of destruction in the rain on just two thin legs. As you look on from just inside the cover of the great green, they begin casting things at each other, stones and fang sticks from items of grazer skin and dead tree, trying to harm their enemies without directly risking their own bodies. When this fails to resolve the situation, some shinestone clad warriors gripping long, heavy looking false talons and fangs charge their enemies and a practical jamboree of destruction begins. A jamboree? The rain makes it difficult to see and smell. Only your hearing can be relied upon. The yelps you hear are often pained, and several of the dancers now lie upon the ground, most still moving, a few not. None of this is your affair, but there may be an opportunity here for a brave or cunning drac. Attack the local no-tails aiding the invaders. Attack the foreign no-tails aiding the locals. Remain hidden until the dance is finished. Leave this distasteful display. There's some options here. Huh. Yeah, maybe aid the locals, but that would be revealing myself. But my... My instinct is to remain hidden until the dance is finished because I might learn something... by watching them further. Whereas... Aiding the locals may interrupt that. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to aid them. I'm going to aid the locals. Let's go for it. Compassion. Here we go. The dance suddenly gutters like a dying flame as you emerge from hiding, crown feathers erect, tail lashing back and forth. The tail is stare, their bloodless wavering, confused by your beauty and majesty. Turning towards the foreign group, you release a deep blast of flame in their direction and sing a roaring song at them. I am your end. Burn to ashes and be swallowed by the void. If you are concerned that the invaders might not understand your mighty voice, there is no need to worry. Your taking their enemy's side has drained all hope of victory. Any who waver are put to mad flight by your charging at them. The warriors from the local hive are elated, hooting excitedly and chasing after the fleeing warriors. Though they clearly regard your assistance as a wonder, they are in no mood to question it, stampeding past you. Soon you are alone, but for the dead and the dying left behind in the rush. Thanks to your intervention, the local no-tails have won a mighty victory this sun, and you did not even need to dance. You take a few moments to relive those lying si to relieve those lying silently in rain and essence of any shiny possessions. By the time warriors return to help the wounded or deal with the slain, you are gone. Actions improve reputation and you're earning a reputation for revered survivor among the kid. I didn't learn anything about the humans though. Oh, oh, are they bringing me prey? The sharp smell of fear paints the air this sun. The no-tails have come to the spirit wood to gather life. Wait, hey. Are, this better be some tri tribute. Most of the predators in your territory either hunt things too small to be of concern or take little enough that your personal diet is not deeply impacted. These new hunters, however, are different. Able to slay from a distance, they give their quarry no chance to run or fight. They visit frequently and harvest many large good beasts each time. They're- Hey! Some of your favorite hunting grounds will soon be affected. It would not be enough to ensure your starvation, but the wealth of prey to which you are accustomed may become a mere memory. On the other hand, the tailists have long memories and are known to be unnaturally vindictive. 
Perhaps allowing them to continue this behavior would be less risky, though your core and essence both chafe at the prospect of allowing these outsiders to take from the bounty which sustains you and is rightfully yours. What will you do? Destroy them. There are three, and they do not seem to be warriors. Drive them away, but let them live. Tolerate them and allow them to hunt here. Hmm. I think I need to send them a message. Drive them away, but they'll let them live. I... Yeah, it might make them come back more, but... They need to not do this. Be compassionate. Yeah, be compassionate, I guess. The most drag hit... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, too late. The most dragon would intervene immediately, you decide otherwise. The music of the tale is strange, and having seen your own creator destroyed by them, you know that they may do the same to you if you give them reason to. It hurts both your pride and your food stores to allow them this, but at least you have not done anything to provoke them, for now you should be safe from their perilous abnormality. It might be better to just wreck them. You know Warden was wrecking them every time they entered his territory, though? And, uh, look what happened to him. Once per comma, you may negate the power of a single element. Ooh, preventing use. Nice. Quite a few scent trails lead to this place, which is close to the Talus Hive, but far enough that you cannot smell it from here. The Talus have brought- it's Stonehenge! What- we're not playing fucking Stonehenge! The Talus have brought stone and tree flesh together to form the sacred water sign. It is actually impressive. How did they move such huge stones, even if you may not have been able to manage it? And oh, how they danced! The children of Stonehenge! No matter, here inside the ring they have gathered. You know that st tailless eyesight is poor when sun is gone, so you will be safe here in the outer dark. You crane your neck, looking up over the stones to observe. Many adult tailless have gathered, more than you have claws, though not more than you have teeth. They are led by one whose whole body is covered in a moon-white second skin, and who seems to be treated with deference. It must be an elder. It has more face fur than the others as well. It barks a few notes of babble song, and the others all fall silent and still. For a moment, nothing can be heard but the plaintive cries of the slave surefoot in the center. This is uncomfortable. Please change my situation. The tailless elder ignores its pleas and begin oh no, and begins to raise its voice in song, striking the same notes in, s in the same sequence over and over. The others join in. It is a unity of number and sound, bringing them all together in mind, and perhaps in essence. After a time, the elder places its forepaw on the shirt's horned head, murmuring something. The tone is gentle, a blessing, perhaps. Good, yes, unbind me. Then the elder turns its attention skyward. It begins to chatter and yelp at the stars above. Is it singing to them? No, it seems to be trying to communicate with something beyond the stars. Something above, something higher than the void. The elder's blabbering grows more intense, more high and wild, and as it makes noise, it slowly brings a sharp piece of shinestone to the sure fruit's throat. What is that for? I don't need that. I need... Destruction. With great intention, the elder plunges the shard into the surefoot's body again and again, until the shard and its paws are slick and red. It walks about to each of the tailless, marking their brows with a little of the beast's dark essence. They receive this mark with eyes closed, as if savoring the experience. Then, seemingly without cause, the wood in the surefoot's body catch fire. The others lower themselves before the triumphant elder, or perhaps before the fire, or whatever caused it. While the surefoot's empty body burns to ashes, the singing resumes, and all seem to be in a state of ecstasy. 
The elder often gestures upward and is barking in an authoritarian yet grace grateful way, a strange contrast. There is joy, much joy, and a savage fulfillment. This sight, these sounds, these smells, they are quite dissonant, especially all together, but the tale is obviously rejoice in them. Eventually, the elder gives a final gesture of its paws in a series of lo locutions. The tale is slowly leave, one by one. They seem somehow changed, as though they were hungry but now have a, had a good meal. This entire act, it fed them somehow. When all are gone and the fire has eaten itself into nothing again, the elder cleans up the remains. The young Talus emerges from inside the central stone, carrying the blackened remains of a branch, and the two sing to each other for a while. Oh, there's been some bamboozling going on. So that is what caused the fire. There was a Talus hidden inside the hollow central stone who lit the blaze at some kind of signal, unknown to all but the elder. The two clearly planned this in advance. And then they are gone. Night reclaims all. A swarm of questions buzz within your mind. Why the surefoot? Why bring it all the way here, so far from its home veil, just to destroy it and burn it to nothing? To torment it, they must enjoy its suffering. To honor it, the surefoot must have been special to them, or to send it beyond the stars. I think to send it beyond the stars. Obviously. Because the smoke, and he was speaking to the stars and everything. Obviously. Surefoot was not special to them, or they wouldn't have killed it. And they didn't seem to be really tormenting it. They killed it very quickly. Wait, what? Where did that thought even come from? How can anything be sent beyond the stars? And yet, the more you think about it, the more that tastes true. They were fixated on the beyond, both before and after the act, and the smoke rising from it. Yeah, it all makes sense. That's it, the smoke. They believed that they were sending it to the beyond through the rising smoke. Which is pure idiocy. The essence clearly dissipated into nothing, just as with everything else. The talus must not be able to sense the spirit colors, which you can. And besides, smoke does not rise forever. You have flown high enough to know that it does not even reach the clouds, much less the void. Much, much less whatever is beyond the void. But every small gesture and sound made by the Elder and the group resonates with that idea. Somehow, you are fairly sure that is what they were trying to do. And why did their own Elder deceive them? It presented the fire as a causeless marvel. But that- hi, buddy. But it was no more than a trick achieved by a hidden accomplice. It must have planned this because the elder was would personally gain from this. The elder was testing their wits. The elder was fulfilling their collective desire. Hmm. So from what we saw, it didn't look like he was personally gaining anything. He wasn't testing them. It seemed obvious he was fulfilling a collective desire. Just from what we observed. Like, of course, me personally... Of course he's personally gaining from this, but... We're role-playing a dragon right now. So, that's what it looked like. That tastes right. You smelled relief coming from most of them in that moment. A strange thing to smell when something bursts unexpectedly into a blaze. But it was so... They seem to want something unnatural to occur, something beyond their understanding, but why would they want that? What kind of being wants to believe that it is in the presence of the unknown? Where ends this twisted path? The destruction of the surefoot, the deception, the songs, they did so many things, and with such intentional arrangement. They were focused on something which was above them, but also within them. Above, yet within. Above, yet within. They came from above and left their seed within their legacy. The others. The others were the focus of this entire series of actions. The Talus were trying to communicate with the others who made their kind. Oh my gosh, did humans come from aliens in this world? The Surefoot must have been a gift for them, and they interpreted the fire to mean that the gift was accepted. And what did the Talus desire in exchange? Power? Wisdom? Treasure? Perhaps a little, 
but the deep satisfaction you smelled within them is one you have encountered before. It was the smell of a small, lost youngling, finally reunited with its creator. <gasps> Safe! The saber tooth! Peaceful. Ringing peace out of violence and fire. When you put that way, when you put it that way, it does not sound so strange. The Drac solve many problems with such tools, and yet it is entirely different because they are yearning for something completely outside of their own ability to attain. Their satisfaction will not last. The others were not truly here, did not truly provide them with anything. How desperate, how deeply in pain the tailless must be for them to need this. To need to believe that they are communicating with the others who gave them these spindly, naked bodies and over-sharp minds. They are blind to the deeper music of earth and sun, and it is not their fault. They cannot even see the spirit lines which color truth into reality. This world must look so empty to their eyes. Could they ever truly love her? If they could, would they cease being other seed and finally become true good beasts, or would it destroy them? You have never pitied anything so much you do the tailless in this moment, as they grope scent-blind through the dark towards their hive, believing in a cruel kind lie. Oh man. That was a banger. Man, this- the adult stage is going by kind of fast. Yeah, that got deep. I'm going to see if I have enough knowledge to check out. You probably got to go through like all the human. Yeah. Okay, let's check out this area here. Oh, is it a burial? Sun bleeds onto the darkening hills. You are about to take flight for home when you catch the scent of several no tails. Where is Warden? <laughs> Curious, you follow the trail to discover a modest troop, including a pair of armed warriors carrying a long wrapped object up a hill. It is a burial. When near the summit, they lay the bundle down and unwrap it to reveal the quiet body of one of their own kind. It seems to have been recently destroyed. The scent of decay is not yet strong. As you watch, the no tails lower the empty body into a long hole in the ground, carefully, very carefully, as though it is merely asleep and they do not wish to wake it. Why be so gentle with an empty body? It does not feel pain, being devoid of mind. And why put it inside earth? It is a waste of a perfectly good flesh to bury it where none can consume it. Even more shockingly, they then proceed to put more things into the hole. Glittering stones, pieces of amber, cunningly strung together, a figurine of what looks like a lumberer out of bone, even one of the shine stone false fangs which they use as weapons. Sometimes they murmur to one another in low tones or lightly hold each other close. A few are emitting muffled cries rhythmically while emitting salt water from their eyes. Others rush to touch and whisper to such ones who gradually become calm, but the warm, salty drops continue to fall. As the set word glow dwindles, they gather together, grasping each other's paws, and then lift their voices in song. Yeah, if we dig up those treasures, they'll be pissed. <laughs> Is this a true song? It evokes something, oh, the music. It evokes something within you, a feeling of despair, as though sun has perished forever and will never return, but also hope, as though the light will somehow come again, if only from within. You have heard many voice songs before. The clan singers, for example, all sing together, but each one is careful to make a different sound from all the others, to clash, showing diversity and strength in numbers. This tale of song, however, takes all of the voices it makes in one, it is as though they are all briefly becoming the very same being, feeling the same emotions. They all seem to know just which tone comes next, and how long each should be. It is deeply intentional and fixed, yet also flowing and emotive. When finished, they fill up the hole together, enclosing everything, body and treasures, in the Great Mother's flesh. They stack a few broad, flat stones together atop the mound, and depart one by one, leaving the two warriors to stand amidst the trampled grass and drying tears. You have never heard of anything like this. When any good beast dies, its kin simply leave it, or consume it. A body without a rhythm is just a shell, devoid of life forevermore. But these no-tails, they are different. They made a special place in earth for their quiet, sang to its deaf ears, put gifts into its cold paws. Why would they put such valuable things under earth, never to retrieve them? The only explanation would be that they believe the quiet can still appreciate and use such gifts, but they cannot. 
Why waste that which could be of much greater use to the living? But most mysteriously, all of the living tailless gathered here were in pain, deep pain. You could hear it in their song, in their cries, in their very breathing. Yet they were all uninjured. What was this phantom pain, whence this gray-blue burden which seemed to be afflicting all of them? The demise of a fellow kin leads to nothing but a rush to claim its land and its trove. It is an opportunity for the living. Why trade happiness and gain for sorrow and loss? It seems mad. Something is tickling at your mind. You shake your head to clear it. An opportunity lies before you. Many valuables are buried under this mound of earth. Also, the body is still fresh enough to eat. It is guarded, though. What will you do? Challenge the warriors for the buried trove. Trick the guardians into leaving. Leave this place. We're just going to leave this place. We're going to leave it alone. You are not hungry for food or shiny things at the moment. You decide to let Earth keep what these tailless have entrusted to her. They seem to be, be behaving as they had lost something very precious. As though, somehow, they had all lost the greatest of treasures. Could it be? Actions are earning a reputation for compassion and self-sacrifice. All right, we got our last human one here. Oh man, it's the Renaissance Festival. Huzzah! Flashes of unusual color catch your skyborne eye and soon you are witnessing a remarkable event. Huzzah! No tales have gathered here, many of them. Some are from a nearby hive, but some are not, and yet no one seems to be alarmed at the presence of strangers in their midst. In fact, the entire affair smells like joy. The air is filled with many voices, many songs. If even half this many kin came to your land for any reason, you would be out of your mind. Why do they delight in being surrounded by so many competitors, so many possible threats? This bears investigation. What is your will? Observe the dancing ones in the center. Observe the one giving and receiving artifacts. Observe the elder with the hatchlings. Observe the fighting adolescents. Observe the courting pair. All right, so we go, let's go ahead and start with the first one. Dancing ones in the center. Joined at the pause, the tailless are prancing in a circle around a dead tree festooned with lesser plants and twisted into elemental shapes. Their feet move nimbly, crossing over each other at times. You never would have believed it if another kin told you that no tails could move their bodies like this. They are also singing, their song rising in unison, following a set sequence, as does their dance. Obviously, they are skilled in memory and communication if they are able to plan and execute such complex dances and songs together. The true question, why are they doing this at all? It seems not to be leading to destruction, creation, or treasure. Why exert oneself, if for none of those? As you continue to observe, you gradually realize that there is a strange sort of creation occurring here. Their essences are entangling, minds joining paths. They have even formed one large body, in a way. They are joining together, but not to create new life. It is physically shallower, and yet deeper than that. Alright, the one giving and receiving artifacts. Quite a few objects are being displayed by a black mane no-tail on some kind of soft non-skin. Oh, he's got a dog. The no-tail barks at passerby who sometimes turn aside to pick up, point to, or sing over the objects in question. None of the things on display are found in nature. All seem to have been warped into shapes functional, decorative, or just plain odd from shinestone, tree flesh, and beast parts. Occasionally, the displayer receives something, a beast skin perhaps, or a shinestone ornament, and then gives one of the objects in exchange. Both parties seem quite pleased, though only one of them should be. After all, there is no such thing as a perfect exchange. A clan singer's slave looks on. It is protective of its master, the black-maned one, but is also quite happy and not at all frightened of the presence of so many tailless. Occasionally, the master reaches over and strokes the slave's ears or scratches its back lightly. Much of the scene is alarming. Beast skins and carved bones serving as mere decoration, unequal exchanges under a pretense of mutual gain, enslavement of good beasts. And yet all of them, even the clan singer, smell quite content. 
happy even. The gestures of pleasure and encouragement seem genuine. They thrive amidst the song-addled air and the body sense of strangers. It is though they have all learned to love chaos. Observe the elder with the hatchlings. A wizened birther croons to a small brood of hatchlings who have gathered on the grass. It demonstrates how to entangle the torn off reproductive organs of plants into simple shapes with which the hatchlings adorn their bodies. Some of the hatchlings are far more skilled than others at the task. One in particular seems to lack the necessary coordination or mental acuity, or perhaps both. You expect it to be stru struck or at least shamed for its ineptitude, but shockingly, the elder does not punish it. Instead, it puts the hatchling in its lap and shows it the process yet again, more slowly and with even more care and encouragement. When the hatchling finally succeeds, they both celebrate. As a lone hunter, you are no great expert in the behavior of social animals, but in your observations of those among beast kind, there is little pity or patience for laggards. Underperforming hatchlings must be motivated by pain, and if that fails, abandoned or consumed. Otherwise, they may become a burden to their people. But from when you, what you just saw, you are certain that this particular elder, at least, would never abandon a hatchling. Not ever. You can smell it on her soul. Danger! Drakken! Wild! Destroyer! Danger! Oh, it seems you were a little too close. A slave clan singer has scented you and is shouting again and again to attract the attention of its tailless masters. If you just fly away now, you will surely be seen. Perhaps there is a way to avoid discovery, however. You could also simply charge in and attack this gathering. Few seem to have any substantial means of defense, and some of the objects being traded would look fine in your trove. What will you do? Oh, simply leave, use your camouflage ability to escape unseen, use your hypnosis ability to silence the clan singer before it succeeds in drawing attention to you, attack focusing on gaining treasure, attack focusing on destroying as many tails as possible. We're going to use our hypnosis ability to silence the clan singer. You fix your golden eyes on those of the clan singer and begin to sing directly into its mind, swaying your body back and forth. O oh, lost shadow of the proud clan singer people, you have forgotten who the true lords of this world are. Behold, I am the crowning glory of earth and sun. I bring sacred destruction to all. If you draw the talus to me, I will make you watch as I slaughter and feast on them all. And then I will tear you apart and give the shreds to true clan singers who still lift their praise to earth and the great green. You therefore wish to be silent and to depart in peace. It is the only path to life for you and those who you believe you protect. Silence, fear, retreat, silence, fear, retreat. The power of your song and the swaying motion of your body render the clan singer helpless. At the last, it believes your song and withdraws, tail tucked low under its body. You make your exit with the no tails none the wiser, having spent the sun drawing closer to the truth about these bizarre invaders. All right. Man, that was the last human thing to click on in that area. So we'll see if we know enough about humans yet. Seventh grade of air mastery. Hypnotize your enemies, forcing them to choose a certain element in battle. Perfect. Alright, let's see. Yes, we can investigate it now. Let's check it out. Here we go, it's the hive. You could even see it from the lower sky. It broods there like a creator on its egg. Oh man, it's completely silent. This sprawling lair which the no-tails have crafted out of tree flesh is the crowning glory of the hive. Many times you have seen them entering and leaving. As the only lair large enough for you to fully enter, it represents a rare opportunity for you to gain knowledge and perhaps treasure. Ordinarily, you would not be able to get close without stirring up a swarm of defenders, but you have been watching, waiting. This sun, nearly all of the tailless have left and gone elsewhere, visiting a setward ring of stones as they do each new moon. Their hive cells stand empty. You were hoping that there would be no defenders remaining, but it seems as though two tailless and a slave clan singer remain, probably to guard the hive's treasure. How will you deal with the guardians? Fight them directly. 
try to stealthily bypass them, try to intimidate them into leaving, create a distraction to separate them, wait for a better opportunity to strike. We're going to stealthily bypass them, I think. We're green for that. Fortunately, you are a master of the art of stealth. Keeping to the darkest areas, you use a combination of patience, swiftness, and perception to keep them from seeing you. Even their clan singer, with its excellent scent ability, has no idea you have passed by them. An impressive feat for one so large as you. Oh, here we go. I got a bad feeling this is where Warden is at. They're going to have him, like, stuffed. Or they're going to have his skin on the ground or something like that. Normally, the tailless use the skin of good beasts to cover the entrances of their hive cells. Yeah, Dragon Skull Throne or something. But this one features large flaps of tree flesh instead. Shinestone and beast horn adorn the barrier. Pushing at it with your snout makes it bend inward a little, showing that it is weaker than the surrounding mass. It will not break easily, but it will break. On the other paw, the tailless must have a way to get past without damaging it. Perhaps you could deduce their method. What will you do? Smashing the door open is going to attract attention. Yeah, attempt to open it without damaging it as they do, and I'm green for that. So I'm going to use my, my smarts. You conduct a full investigation of the twin slabs of dead tree. You quickly discover that neither pushing nor pulling on them will work. There is a very narrow gap, keen as a tooth, between them, and you can just barely make out something on the other side barring the portal flaps. That must be what is preventing them from moving, but the space is very thin. Carefully, you insert a single long, thin claw into the gap and move it upwards. You feel it catch on the bar, and then, with a little effort, you lift it up and away. Nothing now stands between you and that which the no-tails value most. Oh. A thousand years of dreams. A thousand years of dreams could not contain this impossibility which now holds you in its warm, sharp jaws. It is music swooping upward and downward from side to side, under and over and around itself without ever making a sound. It is music, the soft, deep reality upon which all hard things float, stripped of its veil and splashed across the outer dimensions. It is music, bold magic of the stars meeting the cloud-shrouded night of the mind. Powerful emotions rise within you, as when you scent prey or behold sun's beautiful demise over the sea. You can taste the very essence of several creators in the patterns, the curves, the lines. Here, in this place, the tailless have opened their deepest selves to each other. The intimacy of the act leaves you almost breathless. It is an altogether new kind of creation, which re one which requires neither maturity nor might, but the tender courage to draw forth one's own soul and let it stand naked before others. How do they dare? Oh, the ultimate artist fantasy. Do they not know that one's innermost self must never be shared? Do they not understand the power it would give others? Or is this, at last, the secret of their alien minds, the key to their power? A new term is needed for what they have done here, because they have reached into their hearts and brought out half. You decide to name it Art. What now is your will? Examine the carved beams. I'm going to do that. These seem to be depictions of the essence of the Great Four. They flow up to down, down to up, closing a circle beyond the layers somewhere outside of existence. As the elements form the supports of reality, these carven representations support this large structure. The utility is both physical and spiritual. Powerful music indeed. Air, water, fire, and earth must extend far beyond earth and sun's domain into other worlds. It must be, or the other seed would not be able to understand them so well after such a brief time spent here. Oh, nice. Uh, examine the floor. These patterns are water-shaped, but immutable like earth and with air and fire shades dancing within. Oh, good. I hope I get water. Four and one. Ingenious. There does not seem to be any given pattern to the changes between them, at least that you can deduce. Each is its own beast, full of meaning and quiet life. 
Would it be possible for you to create something like this? It seems lewd to smear one's innermost essence out like this. It is indisputably brave of them to try. Uh, examine the far wall. Multifarious reality has been immortalized here. Stern-looking clan singers hunt noble wood striders across time itself, an endless dance of destruction. Outside of this lair, no tales seem to act without any regard to the sovereignty of the good beasts who have dwelt here for turnings beyond count. It would be easy to assume that they feel no respect for any people but their own. But by such art as this, you may be certain, the Talus do find Sun and Earth's native children beautiful in their own way. But if this is so, why do they murder the trees and chip away at the green, sub-mother of so many tribes? Do they immortalize them here because they feel the music and the essences of the clan singers and the wood striders, or only because they wish them to be abundant for the harvest of their flesh, their skins? It is love they feel for these good beasts, or only rap rapacious lust. Too much of their essence has been poured into this for, this for it to be merely the latter, and yet their other actions belie the former. And what are these? Are these how they see themselves? Merging of beast elements with other seed? Do they wish to become good beasts after all? Or are these depictions of the others who created them? Could this be yet one more technique by which they attempt to gain their favor, their attention? No, this does not carry the scent of utility. They are not trying to do any one thing by this. Instead, they are trying to express something, to rotate it laterally in relation to concrete exi existence, bending it. Trying to look at it from a direction heretofore unknown, unsung perhaps. Whatever the intent, it is difficult to look away. Everywhere your mind rests, a new small secret seems to lie, half buried behind the forms. I guess search for tr treasure? No, you know what? I think I'm gonna leave. I don't think I'm gonna look for treasure. Yeah, knowledge is the treasure that I found here today. Wise were you indeed to come here. You have seen the secret soul of the seed of the others. Yeah, I, I have looked deep into the soul of the others. And that is the treasure. You turn to leave. Oh no, here it is. Oh! It was right behind you the whole time. Oh no. Buddy, Warden, your perfect head. It was gazing at you with dead amber eyes. So this is what remains of the guardian of the Riverwood. By the smell of it, it was silenced four, perhaps five turnings ago. Did they honor it with a true dance of destruction? Or was it tricked, trapped, poisoned? Did it end life in confusion? It was known to have believed the tale is to be nothing more than annoying vermin, easily quashed. Now, each time they leave this place, the no-tails gaze upon its quiet head. Do they feel pride at having destroyed such an advanced being? Hatred for your people? Is it beautiful to them, or ugly? They seem to have attempted to augment it, replacing the eyes with calcified tree essence and holding it all together with gut string. It makes it look all the more violated and unnatural. They are not even allowing it to return to the mother and finish the great cycle. What will you do? Leave it where it is, return it to Earth. This, we're taking this. The Talus will be wrathful to lose a symbol of their own power, such as the head of a kin. They may seek revenge. But you will not allow one of your own beautiful people to be divorced from the way of life with this false immortality. Seizing the head in your jaws, you abscond with it. Taking flight, you travel for a short while before dropping it into a deeper part of the shallow river near the Guardian's old home. The water and silt will help it find the dissolution it deserves. Soon nothing will remain but the bone, and then nothing at all as it was meant to be. Yeah, this shall not stand. To attempt to preserve a body against the will of time is blasphemy. The void is worthy to receive all. Oh, 
Zealous Plume, a tiny portion of the late Sovereign of the Riverwood. Quite attractive. You wonder if Warden had the chance to create before it perished. Oh, Maybe he didn't get any uh, alien dragon smash. Well, they may be mad at me, but you had already begun to suspect the demise of your fellow kin. Not having encountered it alive yet was evidence enough. The true question is this. Why did no other kin move in to take over stewardship of the territory? Are the tailists so great a threat that other kin are not now powerful enough, bold enough to assert their claims? Never before have you heard of such a thing. Kin are permitted to fear only each other. As you depart, you reflect on how greatly the way of this world seems to be changing. You have beheld the power of the no-tails directly, this sun, and understand them deeply. Their soft exteriors hide a power beautiful and dread, mysterious and brutal, like nature itself turned sideways, like the rise of night, like a draken. All right, I'm going to take a brief pause here um, for Sippy. And I'm um, just going to go ahead and uh, take a brief pause, and we will be right back. <laughs> 